folks, good evening and welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, or one of your hosts, Josh Turner, also known as Wolf. Um, and with me tonight is Anthony and Tony. Y'all want to say hi? Hello, hello, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Bringing you another cool episode. Okay. And remember, they are doing this under duress and against their will. Yes. Um, especially when I told them that we were going to be talking about this, they were like, no! And... I'm going to blink twice to, uh, to sig signal that I need help, but you can't see it. But just know that I am furiously blinking. They are trying two to time. I'm double blinking as fast as you can possibly imagine. SOS. SOS. I'm sending uh, smoke signals, so hopefully y'all can see that. I'm actually blinking in Morse code and begging for help. Yeah. yeah. But I got the whooping stick out. Yeah. I said, y'all going to do this episode. I don't care. I'm going I'm to I'm beat you like uh, Michael Jackson's dad beat gold records out of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> finally some truth from josh turner oh there you go finally finally uh I, I feel you know i feel really bad i was thinking i was reading about him the other day michael jackson yeah yeah, oh, yeah he, he, his family he his dad was horrible oh yeah i mean i, I had i had he treated his stuff. kids as his meal ticket yeah that's all they were they yeah. were just it was terrible what the, those poor kids went i feel bad when people talk about them i just you know and i really wonder about the truth about him because he was, you know, there was a song that he had made. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 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 And, and, and then after that, it was like, Oh, he did this, he did that and blah, blah, blah. And then you wonder, but, uh, who knows, man, that's not, that's not what this episode's about. But anyway, we are going to be starting a project of pretty soon about rock and roll myths and legends, not just rock and roll, but music about the music industry. Yeah. And, uh, it is a target of ours, but in the meantime, we are trying to get a song released uh, it's a collaboration with our friend Lab Blackburn from Ghoul Town, and uh, my wife is working on that uh, with another guy named David. And uh, hopefully, it'll be out soon. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm I'm excited. Yeah, it's gonna be really cool. And, yeah, Nelly is really on fire with those. We had two songs, but she's a perfectionist, a bit of a perfectionist, and so she was not ready to release them. I listened to one of them, and I was like, oh, that sounds good." But then she was like. Well, check out this flaw, and I'm and so she's she's gonna know now. But I, I didn't know what the hell I was listening to. <laughs> I was like, mm -hmm, mm hmm, oh yeah, I can hear it. Yeah, that totally. Uh, there's a bit of a uh, set of, uh. <laughs> and she's like looking at me, and I'm like, so she, you know what I'm saying? Why it's not right? And I'm like, mm, yeah. I honestly, I don't know what the hell she was hearing. I didn't hear anything. Um, but like I said, she's going to know now. <laughs> that, was like, that was like a week or two ago. And I was just like playing along. Like I'm not tone deaf, but I didn't know what the hell she was, what she was hearing. I was like, what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> but uh, her and my brother have an ear for music that I just do not have. I am not. If you heard me trying to sing on rumble the other day, maybe with some serious lessons and maybe electroshock therapy, I could <laughs> probably bust out some, some, some Tunes. hot fire, you know, <laughs> something. Uh, what's it called? No cap? Is it yeah, no, yeah. no cap? Yeah, That's no what, cap is when you're not lying. When you're not lying. No and cap, when, yo, no when cap. When you're capping is when you're when lying. you're capping. See, back when I was young, some capping reason, meant you were shooting. Yeah. Yeah, bust the cap. <laughs> bust the cap. But for some reason, when you have, I guess when you have a baseball cap on, you're lying. And when, you, when you're you take not it off. wearing one, you have to tell the truth. Well, that's the rules. Everybody knows that's the rules. Yeah, man. it's the Zoomer code oh, by Louise. which they're all bound. I have to. <laughs> by which they're all bound. Speaking of being bound, there's some things that are bound to this. Uh, uh, what we're going to talk about in this story, and then when they're unbound, things can be a little wacky. Uh, before we get into that, though, check out the Paranormal Roundtable group. I looked on there the other day, and it's growing now. Again. Yeah, they had they had like literally stifled our growth on there. And now it's growing again. And of course, Paranormal Roundtable is growing. More listeners on the podcast, more listeners on mm -hmm. YouTube. We're, we got 36,000 we hit on YouTube. Real numbers. We're not buying subs. We're not buying views. We're not buying comments and uh, likes because apparently you can buy all that and we're not doing it. Yeah. We're all organic, real, uh, all organic, uh, grass fed, free COVID, range, free range, uh, cruelty free, non GMO, no antibiotics, uh, views. Uh, uh, podcast or organic podcast yep, whatever all views and subs are real um so it, that being said folks there's different ways to support the show if you want to make a donation there's going to be a paypal link on on the in the on the chat that you can you can donate to 
and you can help out that way, or you can buy a membership. Now, a membership gives you the opportunity to win swag every Sunday. We pick at least three people. Sometimes we pick four or even five people. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you're a moderator and you haven't gotten anything, well, you know what? You're you're, you're going to get your stuff. Nobody's going to uh, forget about you. Um, and so I wanted to say th- there's a few people who have reached out to me through the Patreon and they're like, Hey, I've been with you, f- you know, for the Patreon, whatever. And, um, I want you to know, nobody's forgotten about you either. We are getting it done. We're sending out everybody's stuff. Mike Wells, I want you to know if you're listening, you're a Patreon member. Um, he, he's just, there's been a few recently, but him in particular, he sent me two messages. I want you to know I got them. Okay. We are going to get to you. Uh, we mail out every two weeks now on usually on Tuesday or Wednesday following the second week of the giveaway. So that'll be next, uh, next Tuesday we'll be mailing off, right? Yeah. Tuesday or Wednesday. So there's that. And then, and then we, we just need to get on the ball. We got a lot going on because we're trying to move folks. We're in the middle of moving. We're packing. Everything is packed. Like yesterday I was looking for stuff and I'm like, which box is this in? Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. And so I just had to go, and uh, buy a new dog. I just couldn't figure out where she was at. I was like, well, you know what? She's in one of these boxes. I hear you. Yeah. But I can't, I'm joking, folks. And I mean, we, we forgot to oh, put I the air holes in, so away. it could be any box. You yeah. Know? But luckily, the handles, ha- with their, it's open where the handles are. So. Yeah. Well, I threw that box away. Oh, my God. It kept moving, so I was like, oh, that's got to be trash. You figured it was a snake. We thought it was a haunted box. A haunted and, no, box. No, I figured I, it was something alive. Because boxes aren't supposed like, to move. So They just, were like, where's Elvira? Yeah. We're joking, folks. Actually, she was just there messing with me before I left the house. When she, it's weird because whenever she knows I'm going to leave, she starts like following behind me real close. Yeah. Because, and here's the thing. She wants to ride with us. The two dogs in the house that, look, that, that think that they belong in the vehicle are Banjo, obviously, and Elvira. Like those two will run out of the house and then they'll run up to the car. And then when you tell them no, they'll run around the car. And then you're like, look, I don't have time for this, man. Yeah. Like, I got to go. And so, you know, uh, but they, but they, they're really good uh, dogs and we love them. We love our pets. We love our pets a lot. Um, and since we've had all those boxes stacked up, the cats have had a field day. They love being on those oh, boxes, yeah. man. They're going to miss it when we take them down, take them apart. So we're, we're moving. We're in the process of that. So we got a lot going on and we're trying to get everything situated, get everything done. And so bear with us. We have things going on. Um, but the membership's a good way to support the show. Another great way to support the show is through the Patreon. There's a 10, 20, 30, 40, $50 tier. When you get up into the $40 tier, you get one of our autographed books along with two book, books from other authors. And then you get the $50 tier, you get both of the autographed books that, that we, that are PRT, you know, my books, whatever. And then the two from different authors. And of course, that becomes with like a shirt. I think the thirty dollar tier and up is a shirt, right? Yeah. Okay. And then sometimes we'll throw in a hoodie or whatever. Um, the ten dollar tier is an autograph book along with a few stickers, and you get like a keychain, key chain, a few other yeah. things. Um, the twenty dollar tier it moves up. You get like all that plus a hat, I think, and that's what we're doing now. And then the thirty dollar yeah. tier you get a hat, a shirt. Um, two books, and then then you get all of that on the forty dollar tier, plus one of my books in the fifty dollar tier. You get all of that plus both books autographed by me. And uh, now here's the thing: somebody had mentioned to me that uh, they wanted to know the name of a particular book that we had been talking about on the show as of late. We had a few. Uh, uh, shows that we had done where it came up on, on now that's on YouTube on the YouTube show. This obviously is YouTube s- slash podcast episode, which goes on to 15 platforms. Um, <clears throat> that is not going to happen. I am not going to give you the name of that book. Um, it is, we slipped up and said it once on the show on the YouTube. Now I'm not going to take it down and hide it or whatever, but I have to put this disclaimer out there. Okay, because we're going to be talking about it tonight. They say, and I say they are people who have actually had this happen. You can go and look these things up. That even having a digital copy of this could cause you harm. Okay, 
uh, tonight's story, and now we've talked about this um, for a while, and now that's going to tie into the City of Night because a lot of people have asked us about the City of Night. So this ne- this episode and the next one are going to be pretty much about that. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and, and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, so don't forget, after this episode right now drops, I'm going to be on BMR's show. Because he asked me to fill in because he didn't have a guest for uh, whatever. And so I'm going to be on his show. We're going to be talking for an hour or two. So if you if you want more PRT, I'll be over there. So just join us on BMR, Bigfoot Michigan Rob show. And uh, that will be after uh, this this airs. So this this will be this should be between seven and eight, hopefully, or whatever. And then after this, I'll be on with BMR with Boomer. So, uh, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, we're also, I'm also on Instagram, Josh Turner, 940, Anthony, you are Mexican jumping meme. Yeah. And you. PRT you know, Mushu. PRT Mushu. So if you want to, uh, you know, and those are just our personal private things. We're not really doing a lot of advertising on that, but we are going to be on TikTok soon. Yeah. Because a, uh, millennial zoomer, whatever you want to call him, has <laughs> joined our team named Kim. And Kim's like, you guys, like, you really got to get on TikTok. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, then let's get it going. So that's what's happening. So h- here's what I'm going to tell you. Now, here, the story, it involves three people in particular, but there's a few other people that, that that are part of it. But I got contacted by a guy named Jeff's, uh, I'm not going to say his last name, but Jeff contacted me. This happened up in Northern California. Well, no, I'm saying Northern California. Northern Napa Valley. Let's put it that way. And that's, I'm going to be very vague about it because there was some, we don't want people going out there for one thing because the area there had some, well, let's get into it. So Je- Jeff had a roommate, his name was Stephen, and Stephen had a girlfriend named Stephanie. Okay. Now, a little backstory they all went to high school together in Southern California, they moved uh, together into an apartment, and then they got a house together. Um, Jeff and his girlfriend lived with Steve and his girlfriend because Jeff and Steve were best friends. Um, also distant cousins. They're like related, like fourth cousins or something like that. And so he said, you know, we grew up together. We were best friends. We were in elementary and middle school. And then we went to high school together. And ultimately we, we went to college and we both dropped out. <laughs> and, uh, he said that we ended up, uh, you know, he, he met this girl at a rave. They went to a rave. And they started hanging out, and they were in the rave scene. Um, this was back in the mid two thousands, like two thousand and five, I think, is when they moved uh, into the house. They moved into uh, the house itself that they had stayed in was in town. There wasn't a lot of problems, um, but his girlfriend, Jeff's girlfriend, began to clash with Steve's girlfriend, Stephanie, and it got to the point where it was irreconcilable. Like they were, they were not. It was not going to work. And so they began to argue and fuss like almost daily. Now, the big problem was that Stephanie, how do I put this nicely? She was a self-proclaimed witch, but according to what both of these guys have said to me, and I didn't talk to Stephen as much as I did Jeff, but Stephen confirmed that, yeah, it was true. She was very obnoxious, overbearing. Um. She just wasn't a, a stable person, you know. She had a really, according to Stephen, she had a really bad upbringing, and she was she went through abuse, and her parents were in sort of a cult, I guess. Well, I mean, I don't guess that's, that's what it was up in Oregon, up in like northern Oregon. And her dad, who was originally from like Modesto, uh, he had like come down, he came back down to to California or whatever, and her mother who was from Salem, Oregon, like eventually um, she went back to the cult, like left her family to go be, like, this is weird, to go be spiritually married to a guy who had like three wives already or four wives or something like that. What a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that was, so it really had a profound effect on her. Um, she was, uh, an odd duck. She had uh, some serious anger issues. 
she went and did two years when she was young for for abusing her sister and her brother physically. Um, like she tried to light her sister's hair on fire, some crazy stuff like that. And then she cut her brother and almost killed him. Um, and now she was the oldest of four kids. And so she ended up like going into a a mental facility for a while. So she had some issues. Now here's the thing. They, she talked them into renting a house. (laughs) Get this. In Napa Valley that literally advertised as being extremely haunted. So I don't know about y'all in the audience, but I mean, like if they flat out tell you, yeah, yeah, there's demons here, man. Like (laughs) I'm probably not going to even entertain. I might be a bit of a deal breaker. Yeah, I think it would be. I think here at PRT, what we would do is probably get in touch with some of our ghost hunting friends, you know, which we know quite a few. And, uh, (laughs) probably uh, maybe blondes and booze and just say, hey, why don't you guys go and, and uh, check it out? Tell us what you find. I'm not going. I can tell you that right now. I don't, I'm not doing that. But uh, hey. We'll be not, snuggled up safely at home. Yeah, but y'all not, have knock yourself that. out if you guys want to go ghost hunting. Uh, the blondes and booze are pretty fierce uh, ladies. I would, you know, um, there's some other uh, ghost hunters like the ones we met when we were at the Black Swan Inn. Uh, they call themselves the Paranormal Putas. <laughs> I might yeah. tell them, hey, ladies, you want to go <laughs> like check out this? Uh, uh, yeah, but but not me. I'm good. I'm not into that, man. And so I just was like, nah, I'm not, you know. And he's like, yeah, would you want to rent a place like that? He's asking me this. And I'm like, how long have you listened to my show? And he's like, oh, not very long. I said, okay, well, you've only listened to about 20 episodes. You need to go back and listen to all 500 and whatever are in the, the deal. And uh Yeah check out the three hour live streams too, you know? Um, yeah, you'll get a pretty good uh, feel of where I'm at when it comes to that. I don't like going, we have actually gone out and then, and then visited and investigated a few haunted places, but I don't like the idea of something following me home. That's just my thing. I, I, I just don't want to do it, man. <clears throat> but for sake of, you know, the show, I will expand my horizons and start going on location and doing some other things. Uh, we were trying to get money together for camera equipment to do those things. And then legal fees popped up. And so we've had to kind of uh, hold off and wait to see what happens with that. But we do, I promise, we are planning on, re- on still revisiting that because that is something we want to do. Plus, there's times when it's just spontaneous. Like you're in an area where people have said, hey, there was a sighting of something. Yeah. And just go and check it out because you're right there. Why not? But this situation here, he told me, he's like, you know, they had this house for sale or for rent. And she was like, yeah, I think it's a great idea. We should go, you know, whatever. So the owners of the house were interested in not just renting it. They wanted to sell it. So she talked them into doing this rent to own thing and Stevens which is his best friend um, and the person that I didn't talk to nearly as much as Jeff, but I did get to, uh, to, to communicate with him a little bit. And he kind of confirmed what Jeff was saying, or he did confirm. He said he talked to his parents and his dad was interested in helping them do it so that they could actually, now he didn't tell his dad that it was supposedly haunted. His parents also were not thrilled that he was dating a self-proclaimed witch and necromancer, which is what Stephanie claimed to be. Now, Stephanie had a thirst for knowledge on the dar- of the dark side, like big time. Um, some of the things he was telling me like blew my mind. When they were living in town uh, in, in Southern California at, in, in a house, um, some stuff happened, like, like she got into it with the neighbors and the neighbor's yard caught on fire and they were inside the house watching TV when it happened. And she was looking out the window, uh, and she's like, yes, it worked. So the people's house nearly burned down. It burned down their backyard, including a dog house and one of the trees and He's like, I'm positive that she did not go out and physically set this fire. He's like, but I'm also equally positive that she did it. Yeah, probably Be- summoned some fire spirit or something. She did. She she claims that she had summoned a fire elemental 
to burn these people's house. Of course, when they came and they investigated and they talked to everybody, they, I mean, there was no accelerant that was found that could have caused it. And the neighbors were like just in shock. They were like, well, this tree just spontaneously caught fire. And then next thing you know, it just spread throughout the yard and it, and it scorched the side of their house. Didn't burn it down. They managed to put it out. But she did take credit for that. Now, here's another thing. Not only did she take credit for doing this, she also claimed to have gotten her ex-boyfriend very ill. Like, supposedly, he almost died during the, 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 the virus that was going around. He nearly died from that, and she claimed that she made him get it. Now, anybody can say these things, but after her proclamation, he came out and said, no... This is bull crap. She's just a, in his words, a, and I don't want to be mean or any, you know, but what he said was he called her some choice words. He said that she's an angry fat girl and basically talked to whatever. And she gave him a warning, I guess, on social media um, that she was like, you know, don't talk about me. Don't talk about my weight, blah, blah, blah. And if you say it again, something bad's going to happen to you. Well, he continued. And the next thing you know, his tongue swelled up to where he couldn't talk. So these were things that Jeff and Steve and one of their other friends, um, and of course, Jeff's girlfriend, all witnessed her saying these things were going to happen, and they did. She also reported, reputedly in high school struck a student blind by touching the top of their head. So she wasn't playing around. Like she had some, this was not like Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Yeah, she was you know, tapped whatever. into some serious dark stuff. She was doing dark stuff, man. Like seriously dark stuff. Uh, another thing that she was reputed to have done was was produce a bat-like creature um, that she like like summoned and it was in her hands in front of like several people at like a seance. Uh, so she had done some really dark things. We don't know exactly of the the, the 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 veracity of these statements. Who knows? Some of these people could be exaggerating whatever. Uh, Stephen himself said that he didn't know if that was true. But Jeff said that he believed that there was a lot of darkness. She liked to play with Ouija boards and whatever. So they move into this house. The first night they were in the house. Okay. And, and like I said, this is kind of a long story. So... The, the, let's start with the first night they, they were in the house. The first night they were in the house, he hears a knock at the door, and he just hears a like three loud knocks. He said, literally, I look, and it's 3.03 a.m. I get up, and he goes, I know the significance of that. He goes, I didn't really at the time because I wasn't into all this stuff. He's like, but I go to answer the door. There's no one there. And he goes, we're out in the middle of nowhere. He goes, we're not like so far out that there's, you know, Whatever. I mean, we're a few miles from town, and our next neighbor is about two, mi- about a mile and a half up the road. And he said, you know, it's it's, but it's pretty desolate, you know, like it's pretty out there, you know. And he said, so we hear this loud knock, and he goes, and there's nothing there. He goes, but then I felt this weird cold breeze, and it was late summer, so there shouldn't have been a cold breeze at all like that. Kind of blow through me. He goes, and you ever get that chill where it just kind of goes right through you, takes your breath away? And he goes, and I was just like, what the heck? He goes, so I walked back to bed, and he goes, in my bedroom um, was the first bed, first bedroom on the left, down the hall, this ranch style house. And he said that it was it was uh, a, a pretty place. It was you know, but of course the uh, the, the owners had said that yes, there were spirits there as. The lady that, that, that rented it to him was kind of wacky. Um, he said that she wore a wig that was visibly, you know, the, there was like this, whatever. And one of the things he noticed, like whenever she had come to the house one day with her, wouldn't be her husband, it was her boyfriend who was like 20 years younger than her. Um, her wig was kind of slipped a little bit and she had a tattoo of what appeared to be from from what he said, I couldn't say 100%, but the bottom uh, the back of her head going toward her neck looked like half of a pentagram. So he did notice that and her boyfriend, like her, whatever he was, you know, um, fixed her wig for her and was like, okay. And so he, she had said that she was recovering from cancer. So that would explain why she was wearing the wig because she had lost her hair. Um, but he thought it was odd because she had, you know, 
uh, eyebrows and, you know, whatever. Um, but he just, he just was like, I don't know. It was a weird situation. She got along very, very well with Stephanie, who was the supposed witch slash necromancer, whatever she self-proclaimed. And she was into all these different books of spells. She had one that she had gotten from England when she went overseas. She was very proud of it. It was supposedly like this forbidden book. Um, she had all of these different, she had the Simon Necronomicon, which is a whole different thing, you know? Now, here's the thing. The Necronomicon is based on, it was an H.P. Lovecraft creation based on uh, some sort of, you know, book of esoteric forbidden knowledge. The usual suspects, Simon Nepper Necronomicon is one of them. It's got some Crowley in and some other things in it. But there is one book in particular that most people agree was the inspiration for that. And I'm not going to say the name of it. Like I said, I've, we've talked about it on the show on the, on YouTube. That book, she was told by one of her friends, um, who was of middle Eastern descent. Okay. And her family is a Marianite Christian. They were from Lebanon and she, they, they lived in Jordan at the time, but originally they were they were from Lebanon, but they lived in Jordan, and she was a Jordanian citizen. But she told her that that's the book she needed to get because she was like, <laughs> according to Jeff, the Middle Eastern version of Stephanie. Um, now this woman, I, I'm not going to say her name because I was told that it would probably not be a good idea. Her family is pretty wealthy, and they will they do like to mess mess with people if you mess if you say something about their family right so i'm not going to get into who i'm not going to say her name so i was just kind of given the the advice on not saying her name um what she did was take her down a darker path once that book once she got her a copy of that book um he also said that he opened up the computer and there was a whole bunch of stuff on there um about spells and Mind control, there was some, some stuff about how to attach demons to animals to make them familiars. We've talked about that on YouTube, about the vampire cult and different things like that. One of the things that really struck me too was that these people played with the Ouija board like daily. And they were really trying to find ways to gain power like these two in particular, these two women. And so Jeff, ultimately, his girlfriend had moved out. Um, once he was no longer living with his girlfriend, when they decided to move into this, this new house, she declined, and then eventually they were further enough away, which he thought was a mistake. He probably should never have done it. But he let his friend talk him into it, and then him and his girlfriend broke up. He said he, he never stopped caring about her, uh, her name was Ashley, but she was not interested in living with Stephanie. It was like, a, she was like, I'm not living with that freak, whatever. She ended up getting into a really bad accident and nearly died. And it scarred, it gave her, uh, her mother a, a nasty scar. Um, and it was crazy. It was like a freak accident. Somebody like went over the, the median and just came right at them head on. And they were able to move uh, the, the vehicle enough to where they didn't get just Head on collision, whatever, um, because a driver apparently had like fallen asleep or something like that, or he had been drinking. I can't remember if, if he was drinking, he fell asleep. And he always attributed that to this woman. Like he thinks that Stephanie did that because they had a feud, her and Ashley. So it's pretty much everybody who ever had a problem with this woman, something bad ends up happening to them. And she's obviously the catalyst for all of this. Um, but she had a, a couple of people that were involved in helping her with this. Now, there was a guy that she uh, was really good friends with up in Portland who was supposedly a self-proclaimed vampire. And Stephen, in Jeff's words, the guy was full of crap. Like, he was just, like, kind of role-playing. Like, you know, like, he wasn't really... Like, he was just some weirdo. Yeah, he was just some weirdo. And we'll get to that in a minute. But when they were in this house... 
one of the things that happened, like he said, the first night he had that weird knock at the door, he said, I go to sleep after the knock at the door. He's like, and I start dreaming. He goes, and this had never happened to me before, even though I had lived with this person for a while. He's like, something about that house and that particular land triggered something that just, it woke something dark up. He's like, and it wasn't like it was before where she was just sort of weird and gothic and was using spells to mess with people. Now it was like she was living in what he called like a nexus, like an energy, because he did a lot of research on this. And he says, I was like a nexus point. And so I know what he's talking about. Um, and so she told him, you know, basically, oh, get ready. There's, it's going to be a wild ride because there's going to be a lot of stuff happening, but don't be afraid. You know, you're under my protection, right? Oh, that makes you feel real good. Um, the person that made someone's tongue swell up and <laughs> you know, start yeah. let somebody's house on fire, you know, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So, so anyway, she ended up like telling him, oh yeah, I'm, you're, you're fine. You're, you're under my protection. He said, I didn't feel too good about it. He goes, especially after the, that first night I had this weird dream that I was in this dark place. And he goes, and it was like a, a, like a town, like a city. And he goes, and I just wandered around and there was like this dim lighting there. And uh, when he started describing it, like the gears turning in my head, I knew immediately. And I said, Jeff, city of night. the city of night. And I said, Jeff, I think you're describing a place we call the city of night. And he goes, yeah, I, I don't know what it was, but... He goes, it, it just, it was dark. And he goes, and it was like a, a whole city that just lived in darkness. Everybody was there in darkness and they, and people would wander around like drones and you would try to interact with people, but most of them were just kind of zombies, you know, harmless zombies. But then he goes, there were some people there though. They were very coherent. And he goes, and I ran into my mother's uh, brother who had passed away like six months before he had died of cancer. And he came up to him and he was like, he talked to me. He's like, he's like, Jeffrey, what are you doing here? And he says, I don't, I don't know, uncle. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just, I woke up. Uh, I went to sleep and I woke up and I'm here. He goes, and it was real. It was very real. It was like I was in another reality. It was not like I was asleep. It was very coherent. Some people, it's still kind of like a dreamlike state to them. And then some, and then sometimes they'll have this very coherent, whatever, but for the first time for him to ever be there that he remembers, and of course he's 29 years old at this point or 28 years old. Um, he said, dude, I was 28 years old and never dreamed about this, never had any interactions with anybody who had had this weird, uh, whatever happened. And he goes, my uncle told me, he goes, you need to leave. You need to get out of here. You don't belong here. He goes, you can get stuck here. You don't want to be here. And he's like, well, what are you doing here? And he says, this is my penance. I have to be here. He goes, for how long? He goes, I don't know. They don't tell you that. And I was like, wow. Well, one of the things that he told them, he said that there were beings there that kind of called the shots. They weren't humans. And he was, he, you know, what he felt like was like a purgatorial type state of being. And that this city uh, was one of many. There were there wasn't, according to what his uncle was telling him, there was many of these cities. And it depends on where you're at and where you're from, and that's kind of like decides where you go. It's like th not just a city, but it's like a, a whole world that's in darkness. Now, you guys know this, Anthony and Tony, how many times we've been contacted by people regarding the city of night and saying that they think they've been there. Yeah, because we know that there's not just one place called the city of night. I just we just called it that, um, <clears throat> but it is like a flip side dark world. Um, like like you can tell it is the spiritual side uh, of of whatever w this is, you know. And so he said that his uncle was telling him this, and the next thing you know, he's like, I felt like I was falling, and I wake up, and I'm in my body, and I'm on on you know in my bed and I'm on my back and I'm just like jumping up and I'm like in his broad daylight. He goes, and my alarm clock's going off and I got to get ready for work. He's like, I had to be at work at eight o'clock and it was already like seven 30. So I was running late and he didn't re immediately remember his dream. Now, that happens a lot, but he said that he started like feeling like lightheaded and thought, man, maybe I need to call in. I can't, 
He's like, I had vertigo, you know? And he goes, but I took a shower and kind of interesting. He take, he took cold showers like me. I thought that he, he had something he had read. He said he read it in men's health. And I was like, well, good. <laughs> Cause that's, that's a good thing. You know? And yeah. he goes, he goes, I try to convince my friends that it really does work. And he's like me, he's all into lifting weights and things like that, which I thought that was cool too. I commended him for that. It's the fountain of youth folks. I'm telling you. So what, what he does is he, he gets up and he, you know, he does his whatever. And then after he goes to the, to his job that he had just started and it was only his second day there. Um, and he was like, dude, I'm, I'm over here, like after orientation and training and I'm already going to be late. He's like, I showed up 15 minutes late and he goes, and they were just like, look, it's not a big deal today, but don't let it happen again. And, uh, so he was like, he had a, an issue with the, the whole knocking on the door or whatever. So he went to Stephanie when he came home that afternoon and he told her, he said, look, I know that you're enamored with all this ghost stuff and whatever, but whatever's going on in this house, like it made me late for work and it's interfering with my, you know, physical life. I can't, you know, if there's anything that, you know, maybe you could like, you know, communicate with these entities or whatever and tell them to, to not be waking me up in the middle of the night. And she literally was like very matter of fact about it and was like, oh, yeah, yeah, they visited us last night. They come from the woods and they just wanted to say hi. <laughs> What's a hell of a way to say hi? Yeah. And so he says, yeah, well, it, it, I ended up like in this alternate reality when he began to tell her and her friend, her, her friend, her Middle Eastern friend, a Jordanian person, um, about what had happened. They were both like, oh, yeah, 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 you went to a place. And he said – he couldn't remember the name of it, so he couldn't tell me, but he said that they had a name for it, like uh, Middingham or some sort of – I know that may, maybe not right, but it's – there was some name that they gave that place. Like, you know, it was like some sort of old English word. He said he couldn't remember it. Um, but he said that they told him, yeah, this is where you went. And it's a, it's a purgatory type state for those who are not really – they, they, they're they going to be there until judgment, according to, to these women, right? And then when he said, this is very telling, he said, well, it's it's almost like hell. I wouldn't want to be there. That, that's terrible. And he's like, and I saw my uncle there. And they were like, well, hell's much better. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they tell Jeff this, and Jeff looks at his friend Steven, and they just kind of roll their eyes like whatever, and uh, he said the bad thing, uh, or maybe it's a good thing, I don't know. He goes, but Stephanie was a very good cook. He's like, but every time I ate her food, he goes, something weird would happen to me. And he goes, but, you know, he goes, she would make like this, there was this kind of goulash stuff that she would make. Yeah. And he goes, and I would eat it. And I, he goes, it was so tasty. I couldn't, I just would eat so much of it. He's like, and then I would get real sleepy. And then I would always have these weird dreams. Well, he said the the the, the first night he ate, something that she had cooked, which was a few days into their stay there. Cause when they first moved in, they were just like having to go to town and grabbing fast food and whatever, because they weren't settled in yet, you know? And so he said, dude, when she cooked about the fourth or fifth night there, he goes, I don't remember which day he's like, but I ate some food that she had made, which was like this peppered steak and some other stuff. And he goes, and of course, sure enough, I go into this like food coma and I go to sleep. He's like, and I, and I, he's like, it was like immediately I'm laying on this recliner. He's like, and I sit up and I see this being sort of vibrating in between the, the, the kitchen and the dining room and it's staring at me and it looks like this small little, um, he, he described it kind of like Dobie, the house elf, you know, from yeah. Harry Potter, but he described it as completely evil and deranged looking and demonic. He said, take that creature and just turn it really evil looking um, and more muscular, you know, and more just just more everything not good. The ears were not these floppy on the side of the head ears. The ears were like pointy up and down. This thing had really, really jagged looking teeth and it had this kind of jaundiced look about its face. And he said that it like literally began to run toward him and then it freaked him out. So he fell backwards and he woke up. And he was in the recliner and he was looking around. There was nothing there. But he was convinced that there was something there because the remote uh, on the tray table that was next to him got – it got the, 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 the tray table got knocked over and the remote went flying across the room 
with a lot of force. And he was like, what the hell? So it scared the crap out of him. And so that was the first time that he had seen one of these like entities or whatever that it was, but it wouldn't be the last. And so he told me, he says, you know, at that point I was like thinking, what in the hell am I dealing with here? Obviously, you know, there's something going on in this house that's beyond, you know, anything because he had not seen anything like this in the other places that he had lived with this couple, right? Now, he did say Ashley, his ex-girlfriend, had said at one point when they were living at the house in, in, down in Southern California that the, she had seen something that was like a black imp-looking thing that had crawled out of a mirror while she was trying to put her makeup on. There were two mirrors uh, either side. They had the sinks with the two mirrors, whatever, yeah. in the house that they were renting, and she saw something that, that not slow crawling out like the ring, you know, it was like, she said that it was like something just kind of like, you know, crawled out of it real quick and was on the floor. Kind of like and what y'all saw down in South Austin. Down in South house. Austin. Yeah. But that thing would jump in and out. She said this thing kind of crawled out and then like she looked real quick and it was gone. Like it scampered away on all fours, but it was like, like built kind of like a gecko. So that was weird. And she, and she attributed it to something that, Stephanie was probably playing with, messing with, summoning, because she was always like, oh, yes, I summon my pets. Like, she would say this. Like, she thought that these things were her friends or her pets, or she was silly and under the illusion that she could control these things. And like I said, she studied, you know, different different books. I know that she was into the Zohar and the Kabbalah and all these different types of books that she could find. Uh, she had some sort of, like, 16th century grimoire that was written supposedly in Deer Blood. Um, a bunch of weird stuff, you know, and there were all these weird artifacts, different types of bones, some of which were human, according to, uh, Jeff, that her friend, uh, that she called Rob the grave robber literally had gone into cemeteries and taken, absconded with people's uh, bones. And so she was like, yeah, I'll talk to Rob, the, the, the grave robber. They, they, uh, affectionately called him Rob Zombie which they thought was cute and that this guy would still, you know, and he ended up getting a job in a mortuary, which made it easier because he would take people's like finger bones and things like that from the corpses. This is what they were doing. Right. And they were using them in their spells and their incantations, her and this other uh, woman, you know, from the middle East. And so they got really deep into this uh, Kabbalic magic and they did all this different stuff. But they took it to another level when they got that particular book, the one that uh, the Necronomicon, the Book of the Dead, is based on. Uh, at least that's what I believe it's based on. And Anthony, you and I have had this conversation, and we both kind of tend to agree that that's probably the most likely suspect. Um, so the the thing that really got me about this whole I don't the scenarios that were going on, it was, I say this whole living situation was that he felt like he was constantly drained, constantly tired. He was always sleepy and he thought it was a combination of being around these two self-proclaimed necromancers and the house. It was like what he said. It was the perfect storm. Uh, one of the things he said to me too, he said that he did not believe that these people, um, they claim that that they didn't they didn't have any problem with Christians or God or whatever, but they did seem to really like have a problem with organized religion in general, and it seemed like they mocked God openly, even though they claimed that they were not they didn't want to offend God or whatever. Um, and I told him, I said, that sounds a lot like Crowley because he would say, well, I don't want to offend God, but then he would do the most blasphemous things he could come up with. And it seems to me, and we've dealt with this, especially as of late, people claiming that they're these pious, good Christians, and then they do and say the most horrible things that you could possibly come up with um, in the name of God. Well, these people weren't making any bones about it. They weren't saying that they were uh, Christians or God-fearing people at all. But they had made statements like, well, we believe in God and we're not trying to offend God. But then they would turn and just do the most outlandish things you could think of. And so one night they invited a bunch of friends over and they had one of their ridiculous Ouija board sessions. 
And he said that it was just them being loud, basically taking uh, hallucinogens and drinking a lot, smoking a lot of marijuana. And then they decided that it was uh, time to pack it up and everybody uh, go outside into the woods where they were, whatever. Well, he said that he came around the corner and he thought that he saw a person still there, but they were standing on the table where the Ouija board was. And he looks and, and this is, <laughs> it sounded kind of funny at first the way he described it to me. He said he thought he saw a young boy standing on the table wearing like a paper pirate hat. And he goes, that's what I thought I saw at first glance. And I'm like, why is this young kid sitting, you know, he said he's probably 13, 14 years old, about that size, you know, of a, of a young teenager, skinny. He goes, and then he goes, and then to my horror, when I look and I start staring at this thing, this thing is staring down at the Ouija board. He goes, and I look and at the table, sitting at the table is one of these dark, the only way you could describe it was like this dark elf looking creature. That was sitting at the table and he looks and he sees what looks like the spirit of like a boy, but he's wearing like, it sounds really weird. He said, it's like, it looked almost like half of a clan's hoodman hood. You know how the hoods look? Yeah. But it was like the boy was dressed in like 1800s clothing and the, 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 from the, from the nose up, there was like, you could see like there was his face and everything. But but from the nose up, there was like this black hood on his head. So it was like this pyramidal shape on his head. And he was like, what in the hell am I looking at? And he said that both of these entities or beings turned and looked at him. And this dark elf looking creature pointed his finger. And he said then he realized, you know, that to his, you know, absolute <laughs> terror or horror or whatever, that there were two smaller little elf looking entities that were on either side of this thing and that they began to run toward him. And he was like, what in the hell am I looking at? He's like, and at that point, so he just like darted out of the house and ran out to his vehicle. And of course he could hear this gaggle of, of witches or whatever they were going out into the woods and talking, screaming, yelling. And he, he got in his car and decided to drive to town with one of to one of his coworkers who was having like a little uh, you know get together, and so he's like, you know what, I'm just gonna go. He was tired as hell, but he decided to make the drive, and he said it was like twelve to twelve twelve miles into you know in, into town, past the other side of town where his friend lived, and so he decided to go over there. He goes, well, when he was driving through the woods, or you know by, that were on one side of his vehicle, he said, I look and I see several nude females like running along you know into the woods i could see them like dancing around and i recognized it as some of stephanie's and this other girl's friends and he was like what in the hell are they doing and he said that he thought that one of them it looked like had a dagger in her hand and so he was just like completely you know appalled at their behavior and what they were doing he said the seances and the Ouija board sessions were like at least three or four times a week and that sometimes they were doing things like strange guys were coming to the house and they were going to Stephanie's bedroom. Of course, she had the the big bedroom and Stephen, I guess, was participating in this. This is his friend and they were having like mature parties, right? And then they were doing like these rituals. And so then one day he comes home from work and Steven and her are having a huge fight and he, his shirt looked like it had been ripped and they looked like they had been fighting, physically fighting. And so Steven told her, he's like, I'm moving out, I'm leaving, I'm not going to, I don't want to be with you, whatever. And so then he bounced and he goes, for whatever reason, he goes, she looked me in the eye and told me you're staying here, right? And he was like, yes. He goes, and I don't know why. He goes, everything in me told me that I needed to leave. I needed to tell her goodbye. Um, he goes, but it was like I had this, I don't know. He's like, I was overcome. You know, this is what he was telling me. Um, this is weird, and it's even kind of hard to talk about. But he said that all of a sudden, he had this sexual attraction to her, which he had never felt before. 
never. He's like, she's not a good looking woman. He's like, she's extremely overweight and she's very obnoxious and she's very loud and rude and she's not a good person at all. And she had, you know, done a lot of really mean, nasty things uh, to people that he cared about. Not as so much him, just as people that he was close to. But then he said that, uh, you know, for some reason, he just felt compelled to stay there. And he said that he even had a friend across town that was willing to let him crash on the couch and he should have done it. So when his friend Steve bounced, he was like, I should have left with him. He's like, but then I ended up staying. And she reminded me that we were still on the lease and that we were doing this rent to own thing, but that it was really under Steven's parents. And so he was like, how does this work if Steven leaves? So she had her friend, the, the Middle Eastern girl, move in with them along with some guy that he could not confirm whether or not he was her boyfriend or just her lover or what he was. He seemed like he was very effeminate, you know? And so he told me point blank, he's like, I thought the guy was uh, was gay, but apparently they would have relations or whatever. But then he would bring over these guys. He goes, and then he goes, one of the guys that came over, he goes, I'll never forget. He was a, he was a very like tiny little petite dude. And he was, he looked terrified. Like they had him back in the back bedroom and he came out and he was like asking him to give him a ride into town. And then he said, okay. And so no sooner had he like gone and got the keys and was getting ready to give this guy a ride. This was like a visitor, right? Um, that the guy began to break down and cry and said that he goes, can you just drop me off at the police station? So these people came out from the back and they grabbed this guy and there was a very big, uh, guy that was there with them, um, that he described as a very large, uh, African American dude who came to him and said, no, it's going to be okay. Everything's fine. He goes, I, I don't know who these people are. I don't know. I mean, this guy it was intimidating. And he goes, and then there was another guy with him that he described as a Hispanic dude that he did not know, but he recognized him as he remembers him selling drugs to one of his coworkers. Okay. And so he said the African American guy was, he thinks was like his bodyguard. So they took this little dude back to the back and they, you know, he heard like yelling and stuff going on and he did not know what was happening. And there were two or three other females back there. And one of which came out of the back, um, completely nude and just like went and started like drinking orange juice out of the jug, like in the, at, at the fridge, he goes, she was very attractive and she turned and she was a blonde haired girl. And she told him, she's like, you sure you don't want to come to the back and have fun with us? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm positive. I don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> And he said that uh, at this point, he was seeing like shadow beings that were happening. Uh, uh, these weird happenings were happening like daily. Place is a Cirque du Soleil madhouse. Yeah. And so he was telling me that he goes, dude, it was like, it was horrible. It was like, I was seeing these shadow beings. And one day when I was driving along, going out of the drive, which it was a long driveway, a gravel road, he said, I look to my left and I see this black shadowy looking being that looked like it was made of like black smoke or something. And he goes, and this is uh, in broad daylight. And I see this like being running along my side, my car. And then it was like for a split second, then it was gone. He goes, but then he goes, I come home. Cause he goes, I had gone out on a date. I'd finally met this girl that I, I finally got a date with this girl that I'd met. And he goes, and I decided to take her out after, after work. He's like, and she was really sweet and we got along really well. He goes, and then when I'm driving back to the house, he's like, I see this being again running alongside the car. He's like, and I got a better look at it. Even though it was dark, I could see that it was blacker than the darkness around it. And he said it looked goat-like. You know how you would describe like the devil. This guy did not, does not, did not know a lot about goat man or all this other stuff, you know? Um, and then when he described this thing to the Middle Eastern girl that, that lived with them, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, that was something that we had summoned on one of our, you know, forays or whatever out into the woods. She's like, and we found something very interesting. Um, and we think that it's a fairy mound. 
And so we're going to go out there with this book. That's the forbidden book that the Necronomicon is based on. And we are going to um, see what we get from it. You know, see what happens, right? And so he, she goes, I'd like for you to go. He goes, and for some reason, I'd gotten to the point where I felt like I could not say no to these people. He's like, one, it was like this palpable fear um, that I, you know, and this is what he was telling me, not in those words, but I think that's what was happening, that he was very tangible, like the threat there was very tangible. If he didn't do what they said, something could happen. And he goes, and then he's like, I'm a very passive person, at least I was. And he goes, so it was real easy for them to to kind of manipulate me and kind of get me to go along with whatever they wanted. He goes, and it was a horrific, uh, 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 you know, just felt like constantly something bad was going on. There was the presence of evil everywhere. He goes, it wasn't just the orgies and all the weird, you know, vile things that they were doing. He goes, it was just, it went well beyond anything that I was comfortable with. They had long since taken me out of my comfort zone, you know. And he's like, and I just felt like I couldn't say no to these people. He goes, the only the only solace I had was going to work. He goes, and at this point, he goes, I was paying over half of the rent. And I was paying the electric bill because this woman refused to work. And she was always talking about, oh, I can summon money. And she would get money, but it was always being used for black candles and, you know, all this weird stuff that she was always spending it on, you know, ordering like magic items and things like that to, to, to do all this, whatever it's was going on. because he got such a raw deal just all the way around. Yeah. It sounds like he was really uh, being abused uh, in every way. Um, and so he was just like, you know, so at one point they basically had cajoled him into participating in their little parties and he felt like he was not having fun. He felt like he was on edge. And at one point, he thought he saw people's faces changing. So we're going to stop it right there, folks. And we're going to get back into it next Tuesday. So tune in next Tuesday for the conclusion to this or the continuation. Yeah, we're going to leave you all hungry so you come back for more. Yeah. And so you'll, 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 we're going to have to come back to, to this, this guy's uh, plight. I guess. Um, but thank you for tuning in to Paranormal Roundtable. Be sure and check me out over at BMR. I'm going to be on there tonight. And uh, I'll see you there. Good night. <laughs>